journalists potentially sitting on some very obviously important stories and some va very valuable intellectual property rights. Let's let's go to Misha uh, Glennie. Misha, tell us about your journey with McMafia because it started off, it was a, an investigative book um, about crime families, crime syndicates and their links to legitimate parts of society and it sort of transformed, eventually became the story of this rich uh, son of a Russian crime lord who finds himself a legitimate businessman but is pulled eventually into organized crime. Um, and I know that was a journey from the story, the book to the screen that took many, many years. Just, just take us through that and, and how it changed and, and the journey. Well, um, it began uh, actually before the book was published, about a year before the book was published, where um, uh, I'm also represented by Curtis Brown, not by, not by Luke, but um, it was Nick Marston who, um, uh, who sort of distributed the book to various companies and Working Title picked it up. And uh, they uh, gave it to two writers and they wanted to turn it into uh, a film. And so um, one of the things you learn uh, about dealing with film and television, uh, particularly if you're a non-fiction writer, is, is that um, there are many, many, many hurdles to overcome um, before anything gets anywhere close to a screen. And so it takes you a year or two to realize that somebody being interested in something, somebody reading it, somebody lining up writers and things like that doesn't amount to a hill of beans necessarily. And so the key thing is to manage your expectations on this. Because at first, of course, there's all the glam about you're going to go on to, your work's going to go on to film and, and television. And it took 10 years uh, and it went through about four or five iterations, McMafia, with different companies, with different writers. I'd just given up on it. I mean, it was just bubbling along in the, in the, in the background. But then, ironically, one of the original people who Working Title had commissioned to write a, uh, to write a script and did write a script, uh, Hoss Amini, uh, approached me together with his friend James Watkins, uh, who directed McMafia, the TV show. And they said, look, can you, give us, can you give us six months to work with this material because we really want to turn it into a television show. And this was at the point when uh, everything was shifting from film into television. Both Hoss and James came from film and everyone was wanting to get a show on Netflix or HBO or the BBC or, or whatever it, it was. But because Hoss and James had such a stellar reputation, Hoss is Oscar nominated, um, uh, it went through, uh, it went over several of those hurdles quite quickly into the BBC and AMC. And what you have to realize is, is that when you sign away the book as an, as an option, and then you sell the book for a film and television, you have signed away the book. You do not have the right to sort of interfere and to say, you know, you should be doing it this way or whatever. Now, as it happened, James and Hoss and I got on very well. Uh, I was, I had an executive producer credit uh, negotiated and they invited me, which was a big privilege, into the writer's room because they found it useful having me on hand as a sort of permanent reference when it came to the big question, which is authen authenticity. And just to put this uh, before I finish into a sort of broad context, with the explosion of television, you have great writers, you have great directors, actors, producers. Uh, what they lack in London and in Hollywood is content, is stuff which is actually real. And this is why journalists over the past five to 10 years have actually started to play a role in the great television shows and, and in film because while they've been uh, honing their skills as writers, directors and actors, we've been running around the world finding shit out and they want to know what that stuff is. So if you get, if you get into it and you start to, to develop relationships with actors, with agents, with writers, producers and so on and so forth, you can be fairly honest and have a, a develop pretty good relations, but you have to know 
that you're not a writer, you're not a producer, you're not a director, and you're not an actor, and that your role is quite a specific one. Right. Uh, Mr. thanks for that. Sorry, I should have said, by the way, to everyone who's, who's tuning into this, um, that if you have a question during the course of our panel discussion, uh, please could you use the Q&A function. You can type it out and then I will be able to see it. We can either feed it into the discussion or we can come to you a little later on. And when I do come to you, please uh, eventually <laughs> unmute yourself so that you can ask your question uh, in due course. Okay, so Misha, you ha obviously have the intellectual property rights in your book. Um, can I just go to Melissa? Let's, let's take uh, a bit of journalism that isn't a book. Let's take just an article, for instance. Who owns, let's say, I don't know if, it's, if I'm writing it for the BBC or Martin's writing it for The Guardian, who owns the intellectual property, the rights in that work? Is it, is it me? Is it the BBC? Do we share them? How does it work? Okay, so if you're talking about a, an article that you've been commissioned to write in the way that you mentioned, rather than um, you're sitting down to write speculatively, then, then the outcome is going to be different. So whether you're a freelancer or you are an employed journalist, um, you will have an agreement with whoever your employer is and there will be a clause somewhere in that relevant agreement um, stating that all IP, all intellectual property rights and other rights created are assigned to the employer and therefore owned by the employer. Um, so this is definitely something to be aware of and it's you know, always worth checking your drafting. Okay. And a lot of people will be employed journalists, so they've got a great story. They've got a, you know, what they think has real potential for drama or, or, or you know, podcast or whatever. Um, what do they do? They go and talk to their employer, and then what happens? You have a conversation. Do they, do they say, well, you can't do it because we own all the rights and we're gonna, we're gonna sell them, uh, or do you some better than others, some easygoing, some not? How does it work? Um. No, I mean, look, they rights are rights are valuable, and um, and there's a reason why they say that everything that you conceive or any idea um, that you work on whilst you're employed by them technically belongs to them. That's not to say that you can't have a conversation with your employer about working on a project going forward um, that may be based on something you originally worked on for them. But the reality is that they will be the owners of the rights and therefore you can't just kind of go off and start selling them to publishers or uh, you know film rights to film producers you do need to ask for permission in some shape or form um, or otherwise it would just it would be infringement um, so so that's that's the position if you're working for someone and there is an agreement in place a written agreement that says that everything that you do is assigned to them it's worth knowing that rights don't move by a verbal contract. So for rights to be assigned, it has to be in writing um, and it has to be for something of value. Otherwise they would be staying with you. And that's something that people don't tend to realize about rights. Martin, let's, let's go to you because um, you didn't, sell the intellectual property rights in, in your story, but you did do a life story rights deal. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get Melissa to sort of explain precisely in legal terms what that is, but just, just ex tell, take us through, as Misha did, your journey from doing the story in 2003 to the film coming out uh, <laughs> this year, last year. Yeah. yeah, I'll try to be brief. I mean, it was a very long process. Um, and uh, I have to say that the Observer was extremely generous in, in terms of the intellectual property, uh, never raised a question about, about, about its own claim on the story or indeed demanded any money. Um, did you go and tell them? Did you ask them, can I now take the rights off or go and talk to film company? Well, no, because, because it, was never, it was never considered. The, um, the only thing that I ever negotiated was my own life rights, which, which they don't own. So... Um, my role in the story was what was important to the filmmakers. Uh, and so it was important for them, and, and Melissa can go into this in, in more detail, but in order to construct something that you can um, sell to financiers and get insured, 
as a, as a film, you need to make sure that everyone concerned is, is signed up. Everyone, everyone who's, um, whose life is being portrayed in the film in a substantial sense, um, but also in this, in this case, a book that had been written about, um, about the story of Catherine Gunn, the, the GCHQ whistleblower at the center of the story. Um, so from the beginning, I was involved in selling my rights, the rights to my story as the journalist at the center of the, of the events. Um, this began in around 2008, uh, when I was initially approached by two screenwriters um, uh, who'd uh, previously only really written rom-coms, it has to be said, um, and uh, they, they had bought the rights to the book. They approached me, I don't know how unusual this is, but they as the writers approached me for my life rights, and indeed Catherine and her husband. Um, and from that point on, we kind of came as a package. We decided at that point, um, Catherine and I, that our fates were forever uh, intermingled and that we needed to make sure that at every stage we made the decision together to, to move forward and whoever offered us um, deals that we would we would only proceed if we agreed to do so. Um, Martin, the, the, the book about the story was not that wasn't your book. You, you the journalism no, was your, but the book. Wasn't. No, and I have that... to say that um, this was. I mean, I I thought it was a good story, but it was it was just one story among many. In fact, I'd done I think four stories that week, um, as you do on a Sunday newspaper, you know, and uh, so it hadn't crossed my mind that this would, this would make a book. I wish it had, <laughs> uh, but it didn't. And so it was, uh, in fact, an American author who, who wrote the book. Uh, so uh, at that stage, it was, it, was, it was me just talking about my life rights. Um, and as in Misha's case, uh, it went through many, many, many iterations. Uh, the original screenwriters, did remain as a part of the filmmaking process throughout, but the script was completely rewritten by the director, um, Gavin Hood, uh, and the original life rights passed to an American producer um, uh, called Elizabeth Fowler, who, uh, in fact, when, when she first called me, I, I, I thought it was a, a friend just um, pretending to be a Hollywood producer, I have to say, um, which is, as Misha said, the best attitude to have really to these things, uh, a degree of, degree of healthy skepticism. Uh, and then ultimately it passed to a company called Rain Dog, which is run by Colin Firth and uh, a producer called Jed Doherty, who's a former music business guy. Uh, and from that point, things accelerated. And I was lucky really in, in that, as with a book, when you sell your life rights, um, you sell everything. I mean, you sell you sell the the writers the, the the freedom to make of your story what they will. I could have been made a villain. I could have made, been made even more comical than I am. Um, and in the end, uh, I was very lucky to have an extremely sympathetic writer director who wanted events to be as close to reality as possible. But it didn't have to be that way. Were you not especially lucky in the sense that you, um, under the first Life Rights deal, they portrayed you and indeed the work that you'd done and the kind of, you know, screaming at interns and, and that kind of thing in a way that you perhaps wouldn't have, have liked, but you were tied by the Life Rights deal, but then it ran out and you were able to correct some of that stuff next, you know, with the next Life Rights deal. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I mean, the original, the original writers were... Um, they were very sympathetic. I mean, they, they had made the decision that they wanted to write official secrets from the book without consulting with Catherine and myself at all. They bought our life rights, but they didn't want to talk to us. They didn't want to be um, hamstrung by that. Uh, and so it did, took on, it did take on a life of its own in a, in a classic way, that, uh, that initial script. I was, yes, I was, uh, I had, I had my own massive office, for instance, which would never happen in a British newspaper for a, a mere <laughs> correspondent like me. I had, uh, I had secretaries. I had an intern who um, uh, some people may, may, may um, know now because he's, uh, he, he's called Faisal Islam. Um, 
who's now a rather prominent journalist at the BBC. Um, and uh, yes, it was uh, rather, so I also had a, I had a, um, a kind of uh, romantic frisson with Catherine as well at one point um, to, to, for a little bit of uh, completely inaccurate love interest as I'd actually, ne- I, hadn't meet, I hadn't even met the woman by that point. Um, so yeah, I mean, they took, they took a lot of liberties. And so I was, I was very, very glad when, uh, when the final script uh, didn't have any of that stuff in it. <laughs> can, I, can I just uh, throw in one little thing here, Clive, about, um, about Hollywood and indeed uh, the BBCs and everyone's portrayal of journalists um, that Martin points out there is, is they're incredibly bad about getting the atmosphere of what it's like being a, being a journalist. And it's almost as though whenever you see, you know, a journalist's office, everyone is running around sort of shouting, Tokyo, hold the front page and this sort of thing. In fact, it's much, much <coughs> more mum, mundane than that. And uh, I think it's actually useful that journalists have a certain influence on films, as Martin, I know, did do in the final uh, in the final iteration which came to the screen so that we have a bit more realism about what this profession is like but that's a that's a side point okay well made yeah. um let's ask melissa and luke a little bit about these things first of all let's just nail down what is a life story <coughs> like steel it it sounds as though you're almost sort of selling yourself into slavery or giving away your you know your identity just explain what it is okay. uh, let's, melissa first and then we'll talk to luke about that so we we talk about these life story rights um but it's a bit of a myth because we don't actually own our life story rights um no one does there's nothing there's no legal basis to assert this so technically there's nothing to prevent anyone from making a film or a tv series based on your life or mine but there it's the associated risks that have to be considered um as well as various benefits that that Martin and and Misha have touched on and the risks that um, that we need to be aware of here are firstly defamation, secondly invasion of privacy and then the third one which Martin mentioned is that if if there's a high risk of a claim then a film or TV production company might struggle to obtain something called errors and omissions insurance which basically um, they have to have to close the financing of the film or the TV production. So um, it's, it's, it's risky to move forward without the cooperation of the subject because of the associated risks rather than there being, you know, a, a so-called breach of life rights. Um, so, so rather than call it, you know, a rights acquisition style document, it's more of a cooperation agreement where the subject basically agrees not to sue and in return they might get some money a credit you know possibly a share of back-end profits um but look, generally speaking i'm right in thinking aren't i that life story rights you don't get an awful lot for them i mean you're not you're talking about what a, a few thousand pounds normally something like that yeah I, look the, the ones that i've worked on haven't been massively lucrative but it's been um you know it's either been a good a good place for their career um it's always nice to have a credit it's also exciting to be part of the production um there's loads of different reasons and there may not be you know masses of money up front but but, you know typically underlying rights holders will get a share of the the profits if the production does well it's not you know major but it's something luke can probably speak more about the 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 figures though luke i wanted to ask you um i mean i think we probably nailed down what a live story rights deal is um but what is emerging from this is that you know this is a thicket of complex you know rights issues obligations uh, you know life rights deals intellectual property rights deals why do journalists need an agent like you and what do you do with them how do you work with them well i suppose um effectively being an agent as a manager you know you're also confident and you're effectively helping um not just ex- not just to use a better term exploit the rights on behalf of the journalists i help monetize those rights you're w- the way we work with our journalists is actually getting to think about 
the long-term plan. You know, how are they going to become a producer? How can we get them writing drafts of scripts? That's, that's my goal. And that's, you know, I think it's very easy just to, you know, sell an article here or there. But I think, you know, going back to life rights, it's about how do we can add value to that project. You know, um, I've got multiple projects where, you know, um, we've gone after the, the person at the center of the story to secure their life rights in association with the article or the book. Because, well, it's two things. Um, first, in Hollywood, there's a huge premium on exclusivity. So you're immediately locking down the ability for anyone else to try and make that story if that person whose story it is is, is, is associated and connected with the project. And two, once you take that project into the marketplace, it has extraordinary value. Whereas before, you might have got a great deal, you're getting a different kind of deal with the life rights attached. Because as Misha said earlier, it's about the authenticity. Um, it's about what that person brings, I think, and how it's identified and how the projects proceed. But going back to your question about being an agent, um, I, I, it's really uh, guiding uh, the clients in, in the marketplace. It's making sure they are talking to the very best producers who are going to give their project the very best chance of making it to the screen. Um, you know, you're looking for champions, the people who are going to like nourish and cherish that particular client and help and help them on their career. You might you might have one journalist who probably has you know could possibly have three projects for the same producer simply because they are really backing them. And you're looking at all sorts of different fee structures. You're not just selling you know the rights and taking an EP position and might you might get a bonus down the line. You know you know I've got clients who are you know getting extensive development fees. You know I've got one client who's got the first ever first look deal from a US studio in the UK. You know, these people are taking some six months sabbaticals from their, you know, incredibly busy, uh, you know, desk jobs. There's, you know, security correspondence to the Sunday Times, for example, it's just allowing them to focus on their film and TV work. So really an agent to guide a manager to answer a question directly. OK. Um, the question's just come in. What, what about if your story involves someone who is no longer alive? Is it, is it best? Do you still have to seek you know, life rights deals or, or you know, speak to the families of, of people who may no longer be alive? Um, Melissa. Um, so I always perform this kind of risk assessment when I'm advising a client on life rights and I usually act for the producer, so the person who is kind of acquiring them. And my first question is always dead or alive. And it's possibly the only time it's good news to hear someone's dead. Um, because in terms of um, legal, legal standing, if you, if you are deceased, then you don't have the standing to bring a claim in court for defamation or invasion of privacy. I should probably say though, that's, that's in the UK. Um, there's different positions in different jurisdictions. I think um, the state does have post-mortem rights of publicity. So that's, that's something to, to be aware of, but yes, it's, it's, it's good news if they're dead. Because, Commissioner, am I right in thinking that your um, one of your projects is certainly is, is based on a, a real person? Um, and you know, just uh, everything I everything I write is based on real people. On real because people. I'm a non-fiction writer. Yeah. You're, but, you're, uh, so, so but it's sort of very focused life story, if you like. Yeah, ne Nemesis is the the life of the guy who. Um, for several years ran the largest drug operation in a favela in, in Rio. And uh, I interviewed him for 30 hours in prison. And I interviewed his family members. I interviewed his enemies, the police who investigated him, the, the, guy, the, the chief of security in Rio State and, and everyone involved with his, with his story. And he has, uh, uh, I am doing it at the, at the moment. I'm working up a script with a Hollywood producer, but we're doing it for television. We're not doing it for film. And he and his uh, girlfriend and their collaborators are doing it for Brazil. Um, in a in a in a separate in a separate operation, and we agreed to divvy it up in that uh, in that way. We have a, 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 a very good relationship. I mean, very sort of uh, business like. Um, uh, 
but it it has had a few complications in it as a consequence but i think we're more or less uh we're more we're more or less over that now um uh and it it's just a question of you know maintaining good communication with with people and being upfront with them about what you're actually doing and then being up upfront with you and if you have developed a relationship of trust then uh then that's okay and uh we did this also around um i was very concerned to uh, so some of the money from if the tv thing comes off some of the money will be going to a charity in the favela which he used to which he used to run and i want to make sure that uh people inside the favela don't feel as though they've been exploited by this uh, by this whole thing so i maintain relations with friends with friends and collaborators there as as well but it 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 has been it has been tricky on a, on occasions it's true um questions just just come in which i, I think will um a lot, of, a lot of people will uh will want to know if the answer to this what about if the subject matter is pretty much in the public domain there are some books on the subject but you know the subject matter is is general has been covered through multiple sources do you have to option anything do any deals at, at that point melissa or do you just say well you know this is so out there that it's fair game anyone can write a screenplay anyone can make a documentary whatever so you know the answer is it it kind of depends right because it's, it's always going to be on a case by case turning on the facts um the first thing to say is that there is an exception in the copyright legislation for the reporting of current news events, um, which is obviously a big one to point out in an event full of journalists. Um, but then, you know, it's a question of interpretation as to whether something's still current. And usually if it's still very much a matter of public interest, then, then it would be considered to be current. Um, but it's a bit of a grey area. And then I suppose the second thing to say is that um, whilst news and facts and information are not subject to copyright, so you wouldn't be infringing, um, it's the creation of a story from those facts that is. So, you know, putting the information and the reporting together in a, in a certain way um, with opinion and expression, that would attract copyrights. But if you are literally just... Um, you've looked at something and it's it's kind of the date the people the place what happened and it's pretty factual then 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 you're safe from from a a rights perspective but it's a tricky one because people say to me oh but it was public domain and i say okay but what about this piece of information didn't this piece of information lead you to that source that then led you to the next source that led you to your ultimate final source and they say well yes and i said well then you've relied on it you know it it, it kind of it sparked and it was the basis of, of, of your work. So, you know, at the very least, we should try and get something down on paper. You know, you might not necessarily need to pay anything for it, but let's get a release or a quick claim and then you just know you're safe. Um, so I guess that's a very long way of saying um, you can't just rely on the fact that something is public domain. You have to kind of question how you got there and what it led you to, to work out if on the way you may have inadvertently um, copied someone's idea or, or, or piece of journalism or writing. Yeah. I have to say, Clive, I've just come in here because the, the, the nemesis story that I was talking about is very relevant to this because there was a third party who wanted to come in and do the story and basically, and he's trying to do it still, I don't think he'll succeed. He basically has to rely on my book because it's the only one with a comprehensive life story of of this guy, and I discussed this with my agent at Curtis Brown, and essentially this is where, as a non-fiction writer, you're in a much weaker position than a fiction writer. But basically, if someone's going to go off and do a story roughly based on his life, there's actually very little I can do about it, particularly if it's in a, a, a jurisdiction like Brazil. Um, it's 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 really tough. So as a non-fiction writer your protection is is significantly weaker than fiction writers. I think, was, I think it, honestly, I agree, but I think it depends on who is making your show. You know, if you've got a, you know, one of the best producers in, in the country with a major writer or piece of actor putting that together, 
most people really will veer away from that and not try and do the same project from my experience. True. Yeah, interesting. Quick question, very quick question to Martin and, and to Misha that's come in. Is there anything you wish you'd known back at the, if there, or is there one thing which if you had known back at the beginning of the process would have put you in a better position, a stronger position? Martin. Oh, I think we, I think you've muted yourself, Martin. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Start that again. <laughs> um, if, I think if someone had told me that um, I was in a stronger position than I imagined, I, that would have really helped. Um, I think we are slowly beginning to realise that um, there is a desperation for compelling content and that, that we as journalists have stories coming out of our ears and uh, whether they're historical stories or um, stories that we're working on now, um, these are meat and drink to the, to the, the sorts of people that uh, um, are, are desperate to get content into, in particular into TV now. Um, so I was very naive at the beginning of this process. Uh, I, in a sort of faux, faux cynicism, assumed that nothing would ever get made. And so I kind of agreed to everything. Um, assuming and, and that, didn't, didn't assuming that it wouldn't happen. And in fact, if I'd been a little bit more robust at the beginning, and indeed, if I'd had an agent, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, think, I think things might have happened yeah. differently. Then again, I mean, it happened, it was made. Mm. And so it's quite difficult not to, you know, retrofit these things and say, well, well maybe, maybe my, um, my naive approach was what, what ended up helping to make it happen. Very hard to tell. Misha, any, any things you really it's, it's, look it's at? Quite, it's, it's quite simple. The lesson is quite simple. Get an agent. Make sure you have one. I was very lucky to have a brilliant book agent and who collaborated with uh, Nick Marston at uh, Curtis Brown. Nick got me a fantastic deal for uh, McMafia. I didn't understand it. I wouldn't have been able to understand it. That's not my job you really need to get an agent because they know, because believe me, TV and film contracts are some of the most slippery documents in uh, the history of literature. And uh, you really <laughs> need people to, to uh, be looking after your back. Can I just say, yeah. sorry, just, that, just to say that the one thing I really learned was that the film industry is built on a mountain of bullshit. Yeah. And you know, people are constantly telling you they're going to bring this actor to the project or uh, they're going to bring this amount of money or this is going to happen here, there and everywhere. And it took me a, it took me a while, despite my, you know, <laughs> supposedly being trained to sniff out bullshit. Uh, it took me a while to realise that this is, it's not just, it's not just um, people kind of fibbing to you. Uh, mm. It is actually the way that, films are constructed it yeah. is it is the business model is about people kind of telling stories to each other about who they might have attached to these projects and and yeah. it's not and like also, i think you're also in the business of uh you know you or you are in a business where that people are in the business to have fantastic meetings with you and so because <laughs> i've i've worked as, as a writer as well as a, a journalist quite a lot and you know I used to say to a friend of mine that we used to write together that any meeting that you have with a production company or producer, whatever, sh however brilliant, should sustain you for about 45 seconds after you leave the room because, you know, much is said and little is made and, you know, they're there to make you feel great, to send you back to your screen and send you back to work with a song in your heart. And, um, mm. you know, it, it, it can be, um, if you really <laughs> rely on all that stuff and take it seriously, it, it can be um, pretty heartbreaking for you. Um, got a question here uh, that's coming from uh, someone whose name I know well, Dominic Casciani, who says, does a news uh, organization have any claim on the intellectual property um, if the story that led to a piece of journalism could be recreated and or augmented by going back to the original sources uh, who are prepared to assist a reporter in developing an idea for film. So I think a lot of people employed journalists may want to know the answer to that because you've done the story, 
Um, perhaps the news organization has dabs on the rights, but you've got the contact with the key person. And if you go back to them, they're going to tell you more and, and, and cooperate with you. Um, Melissa. Um, am I to assume that the source doesn't have any form of exclusivity agreement with the news outlet? Well, let's assume that for the, because in my experience, they, they won't most of the time or quite a lot Fine. of the time. Okay. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, look, it's kind of the same way um, I answered the life story rights. You know, we, do, we don't own the rights to our own life story. So similarly, how can you own a story that belongs to a source that is a living individual? It's a, it's a similar kind of answer. Um, but I guess it would depend on the subject matter and, and what the deal is with your employer and whether you're allowed to, I mean, you know, rights wise, you might be fine, but then you need to look at whether there's any contractual risk between you and your employer. Um, so it's, it's always looking at the two strands. Do I have a rights related risk or could there possibly be a contractual risk? Can I, can I just jump in? Yeah, sure. sure. I, I think the interesting, I mean, this is what I, I like working with an agent would do. If you basically had, a, there are some publications that have a slightly more onerous uh, rights hold on your on your articles. You know, obviously, if you're writing under contract, you know, we always say to any client, you know, if you can retain all, all ancillary rights as much as you can. The other way, which we do all the time, uh, would be, I, I've done this with major uh, Guardian um, writers where they're completely locked up. So the Guardian actually have their own uh, company that sells and, and looks to monetize their film and TV rights. So we've had situations where the, the journalist hasn't been able to freely sell the underlying film and TV rights to that article. So what we've done is, because of their, maybe leaning on their relationship with their editor, which is really important, because normally the editor won't, you know, he won't really care. He's, if they have a good relationship, they want to maintain that. So he will normally talk to the rights division and say, look, we're not going to sell this, but the, but the publication might still not want you to sell that article. So you'll probably get them to sign a quick claim. And that we don't, what we normally also do is get that journalist to create an entirely new piece of IT, IP that they'd have ownership on. And by that juncture, you could actually bring in the life rights into that project. And we'd normally try and help them facilitate that and, and help them sign the life rights to that particular individual, whoever it was. So if yeah, you know, and just hmm. kind of add to what Luke was saying. I, I agree. You know, there's there's quick claims to be signed, and a lot will be to do with the strength of the relationship. But I think what's important for listeners to this panel to understand is that for every piece of original work, um, you can carve up the rights in various ways and grant them to different people. So. You know, you can grant the film rights to a film producer, the publishing rights to a publisher, stage rights, radio rights, and so on. So, you know, you can almost look at it like a cake where you can give different slices of the cake away, providing that obviously in the documentation, there's no kind of overlap in terms of you're not double granting the same strand of right. And that's how you can monetize um, your original work by carving up the rights and, and selling them separately. That's the aim, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> general question. What's the best way of seeking to protect your rights in a story that you're, you're working on? I suppose that would go, I mean, Martin, you probably learned the hard way. Well, write, write, write a book, I guess, and have the intellectual property rights, and that's, that's one way of shoring up there's, your rights. That's, that's one way, but in, increasingly, I think, um, there's a recognition that there is a, there's, a, there's a huge appetite for these kinds of stories. Uh, and, I mean, I, I think increasingly, I'd be very, very interested to hear the, um, you know, the, the experts on this, that uh, it was very clear that one of the advantages we had even though much of the script wasn't used in the end, was having a script, which gives a sort of intellectual, uh, well, yes, a creative integrity to the project. So people could immediately look at a script and say, oh yeah, that, that sort of makes sense as a narrative. Um, and certainly by the time that we had the, the final script written by Gavin Hood, that was extremely precious. Mm. Uh, and I think increasingly what's, what's likely to happen is that um, journalists get into a position where they are very much involved in 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 writing those scripts uh and indeed in thinking of ways of um embedding their rights at a very 
early stage and i think in the in the age of the podcast this is going to develop very quickly if people are clever yeah. um so we <laughs> question here um which is when do you know whether one of your stories is ready to be turned into uh something dramatic um <laughs> i was wondering actually misha with, with you whether the fact that you're you're the, the project you're working on now is very much focused on one individual it seems to be i mean tell me if i'm wrong was there a journey from writing mafia to thinking well actually you know every film needs is it kind of plonked on the shoulders of a main character so if you focus more intensely on one individual and their story is compelling that's a very good way of attracting interest um uh, yes, I think th I think that is true. I, there was a book that I wrote in between Dark Market about uh, cybercrime and hackers and computer se security, and that is uh, also at the moment I'm I'm co-creating a uh, drama series uh, using the characters or, or sort of approximations of the characters from from there, and the experience of Dark Market made me realise that. Um, the next time round, rather than have several characters, which I do in, in both McMafia and in, and in Dark Market, that if you focus on one character, it actually helps you structure the book in, in the first place. And I was helped by the fact that uh, uh, Antonio's story was, was, such a, was such a cracking story, um, but I couldn't have done it unless he'd unless he had spoken to me. And once he agreed to speak to me, and I had that first meeting with him, uh, I, I knew that this was the way that you had to do it. You had to focus on this single character. And of course, this is, you know, there's no question that for filmmakers and for television drama makers, uh, they are all always looking for the main protagonist. And one of the things that you realize is, is that the world, I don't know if you're dealing with a sort of environmental crisis or a pandemic or whatever, is secondary as far as the filmmakers are concerned. What is always primary is the main character, the antagonist, the secondary characters, and the narrative journey that they, that they go through. So we as journalists tend to think in a much sort of bigger picture way. And for film and television, basically, the bigger picture is really a secondary consideration. Uh, I mean, it can be nice and it can be turned into an, an, an advantage. But so, for example, what's special about Tony Soprano is not the fact that he's a New Jersey gangster. It's the fact that he is a middle class guy going through a middle class crisis and that he needs a shrink to talk the whole thing through. <clears throat> fact that he's a gangster is what makes it uh, extra piquant as it were but essentially it's his story that is the most important thing that David Chase was the producer and writer was concentrating on rather than a generic gangster story. Okay um, now look I see we've come to the end of the sort of panel part I promised we'd have questions um, I think I maybe have <laughs> gave people a wrong steer on that so I think the way we do this is that if you are an attendee and you have a question, you can put your hand up. I can see you put your hand up and then I can unmute you. So whilst you're thinking of your questions, if you want to put your hand up, please do. Um, but let, can I ask um, a question of uh, Melissa? Because there will be a, a lot of freelancers who will be listening to this and tuned into it. Um, uh, explain how the position is different in terms of rights for freelance journalists as against employed journalists? Um, there is no real difference. Whether it's an employment contract or a, a freelance contract, um, there will be a clause in it that re is regarding IP and it will say something along the lines of you agree to assign all of your IP and other rights in relation to any work you do as a matter of course during this employment or contract. Um, so, so really that there's kind of no difference. It's, it's more in the drafting than anything else. And obviously all of these contracts are and should be negotiable. So if you look at that clause and you think that it's too wide and actually 
it's encroaching on some of the other work you're doing as a freelancer, then it's time to speak to the person employing you and say, I need to make sure that this isn't going to co cover the work that I'm currently working on for X, Y, Z, or, you know, anything that's outside scope, I can, you don't have any right to. And I think, you know, it's with any agreement, it's all about clarity and drafting. And that's what needs to be looked at. Okay. Thank you. Good. Right. That's given us time, me time to work out, I think, how this works. So we've got a question from Colin Freeman. Colin, I'm, I'm going to click the button that says allow you to talk. So can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Has that worked? Still muted. Still muted. Okay. Uh, yep. Talking permitted on my end, Colin. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, if we have a book project that we hope might be of interest to either film or TV people, is the only way really just to put it in the hands of an agent and hope that they can then do their thing? Or is there any way you can proactively go around people, be it script writers, people with connections in TV, to see if they can generate interest? Because um, uh, <clears throat> in my experience, agents, are, you know, some agents are better at some things than others. And uh, <laughs> you may not get one who's, only, who's interested in taking the thing on. So sometimes you might just want to try and be proactive rather than just waiting. Yeah. Okay, it's Colin, got the question. Thank you. Um, let's go to an agent, Luke. Um, <laughs> DIY, go around, try and put a package together, attract some talent, get a great actor, get a, a great writer on board, or, or come straight to you. You can do that. You can do anything you want. I mean, the point of being an agent is we like, you know, we offer protection. You know, you're not going to get ripped off if we're representing you. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is that, you know, I'm not just, you know, um, blowing the trumpet of someone like Curtis Brown, but when we take on a client, regardless of whether the project's a book project, a treatment, an article, we'll, we'll collaboratively talk into department about what this should be initially in, in, in collaboration with the, with the client. You know, is it going to be better suited as a podcast? You know, um, it is, is this factual? You know, all those departments will have a chat about it. And, and I think also, you know, we've had situations where quite recently there's two projects actually that have... Um, are shooting next year as as as, as movies, um, which is rare considering that I say eighty five to ninety five percent of what we do is TV at the moment. Um, they came in and they wanted to do it completely different, and we sat down with them. And we said, "Look, why don't we create this as a book? Because there's so much story here, and you're such a you're such a brilliant you know writer and as it were." And it worked out better. We we sat there strategically, and they went out and got a got a book deal with a client of mine who's their agent for, for the literary side. And it enabled me to get them a much better deal in, in, in the marketplace. And if they're selling an unpublished book or a, or a treatment, basically. Okay. Um, someone's asked a, a question about the difference between an option, something being optioned, and a shopping agreement. Um, I think we probably understand what an option is, but can you explain? Sounds like someone's been offered one or t'other of those, but can you um, explain? Uh, Luke, probably best to go back to you again, if you could briefly explain the difference between the two. I mean, um, loosely to a shopping agreement is a much, uh, much looser arrangement. Uh, I, I always find we don't do many of them because the idea is to try and make sure our clients are earning money. That's first and foremost. Um, a shopping agreement is more of a simplistic short term agreement, which would give exclusivity to the producer on the project. Um, only, only with limited rights, though. Only limited rights, probably the film and TV rights. So all those ancillary rights that Michelle, um, Melissa, sorry, uh, spoke about earlier wouldn't be part of that agreement, and then it would allow the producer to go and try and set it up with a third party. Which at that point, an agent would be able to negotiate the deal directly on behalf of the client with the buyer. Um, an option is a much more complicated, you know, position. It's an option to buy. The bottom line is, is that, I mean, you know, there's a rule of thumb, a shopping agreement, you don't get any money for it. Yeah, and it, pretty normally. It's a you, 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 temporary we, thing as somebody's basically trying to pitch it to a network or something like that. Okay, so someone who has a little more clout in the industry and contacts will say to you, let's enter this agreement, I'll take it around for a year and a half and, yeah. and try and get well, it made. Shopping agreements are much more on, on short-term agreements, so three, six, three maximum months. 12. 
Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, I would never agree to a shopping agreement more than six to 12 because then, you know, you're taking the, the, the inherent value uh, off the shelf for a long time for nothing. Okay. Um, Melissa, someone has asked me to get your take, please, on uh, the, the best way to protect your rights. I think Luke uh, spoke about that, but um, how would you, what would you advise? I mean, it was always said, you know, that you should post a letter recorded delivery or post a, a copy of whatever you've written to yourself on a show, you've done it on a given day, you had, you know, it was your original work. Uh, okay, that advice sounds daft, but it actually still holds true because the issue is that copyright doesn't arise for an idea in your head. What you've got to do is get it down on paper. Um, and so kind of my strategies in terms of protection are quite simple. And this is all in the context of the fact that we don't have a formal record in this country, unlike in the States where they've got the copyright office. So um, you've got to use some common sense when it comes to this. So, you know, write your work down, date and name your work, um, keep it safe, send it to yourself, registered post, you know, don't open it so that you've got the postmark on there. Some people email it to themselves regularly, but I have to take a slight issue with that because obviously you can quite easily um, change an email to, you know, you, you can format it to look any date that you like. But, um, you know, aside from that, it's also, you know, kind of the heartbreaking thing and, and a mistake that I've come across recently for a journalist client is um, if, if you're talking to somebody, so, so let's just say you, you're talking to a producer about possibly them taking the, the film rights to the piece of writing that you're doing, is don't start handing over the work and all of your sources before you've actually got an agreement in place outlining the terms, because although trust is a lovely thing, certainty is a far better. Um, so, you know, it sounds very simple in terms of protecting your idea, but don't literally give it away to somebody who is, you know, as Martin said, kind of offering you the moon and the stars in the sky. Um, don't, don't fear of offending them and saying, yes, you know, I can kind of give you the skeleton, but I'm not going to hand anything over until we've got something in place to say that you can't take this and do it without me. Just to say, I'm not getting that many hands up, but lots of questions are still coming in uh, on the chat. So if you want to, if you want to ask a question live, then put your hand up, and um, I will come to you. Um, so, question, another question uh, from somebody who says, "Look, what if you want to write the script yourself? You're the journalist. You've done the journalism, but you really want to write the script. Is that a case of just um, knowing horses for courses and a big any sort of production of any size is going to put uh, a well-known writer with a track record in that genre uh, onto it or are there worthy exceptions to that rule um, and so what? there there are there are journalists who go on to do to do screenwriting uh, i'm at the moment co-writing with a much more established writer one of the uh, uh, the dark market uh, thing and we're sharing the writing but she's doing the she's doing the bulk of the writing and we're co-creating. What you have to understand is, is that the talent and the skills and the craft required to write a film or a television script is as far away from the talent and skills and craft required to write a non-fiction book or an article as can possibly be imagined. And if you're going to go down that road, you have to do a lot of very, very quick and hard learning about the nature of television writing because it is, uh, I mean, I've been around writing now for about, I, I guess for about six or seven years and I'm just beginning to see, uh, you know, how it's possible to frame these complex issues in what are incredibly taught uh, short spaces of time in which uh, most people think that it is uh, the the premium is not to use words. It's the whole show not show not tell thing. So people who have been you know who can be incredibly elegant and brilliant writers, uh, not just of nonfiction but of fiction as well, 
they have a lot to learn before they can just sort of barrel into a, a television or a film script. Martin, you're, you're nodding. In I'm agreement. nodding crazily. I mean, yeah, I was, I was yeah, quite... You were never tempted to do try oh, and... I'm, I'm, al I'm always tempted, but I'm, uh, I completely agree with, with Misha that it's a very different skill. I mean, I was lucky enough during the, the writing of, um, of the journalistic scenes in Official Secrets to be very close to that process. And uh, I was almost, I mean, virtually, in fact, pretty much like this over over Zoom calls and telephone calls with uh, with the writer in 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 Los Angeles. Um, as he was writing, I was watching him do it. As I was feeding him incidents and lines, and it was an extraordinary thing to watch. But it, it's a completely different skill. Uh, I'd love to think that I could learn from that and, and be involved uh, at a later stage, but. But I, I do wonder whether the future is much more of that kind of collaboration. I hope it is. I mean, I think that, I mean, Misha will have probably found this as well. It's a fascinating process. Um, but I think you do need both sides of the um, writing process. You, you know, they need, they need us and we need them. Uh, and I, there are some journalists who can make that transition. Um, well, I've got but, like five. Yeah. Just, just give an example. So, you know, my, my plan is to basically build the, the individual into a position where they can take part in a writer's room like Misha's done and see firsthand yeah. the level of intricacy and detail that goes into a major high budget production. And you've got to take it to things like, you know, what's the format? If it's TV, what's the format? How many hours? In other words, you know, writing six hours of TV is backbreaking even for a major TV writer and then the other thing to bear in mind is especially if it's TV is that buyers distributors um, you know whether it's an SPOD platform whatever their premium is on who's going to be adapting it they want mm. an absolute known entity is going to give that quality so bearing than that my, it, 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 we sometimes see a project where you know the voice of the individual who's written the project is so unique they will give them a shot okay but it's a, it's a long, hard road. So I've got about five or six um, journalists now who over about six years are now in a position where they're in writer's rooms and they're writing an A episode under tutelage of the main writer, the showrunner, on, on long-running shows. But it takes a while to get there. And as Misha said, it, it, yeah. it's complicated. Yeah, some people, some people actually say, you know what, I don't want to... I've seen the process. I don't want to do it. I just want to be more of a producer, keep creating the content, you know, enable myself. And some are, I want to write my own projects. And that's the long-term goal, I think. Right. I want to ask you all about money. Uh, I think a lot of journalists will be slogging away thinking, you know, um, is there gold in them there, Hill? Uh, this year it was reported that you, uh, I think, sold the rights to McMafia for a six-figure sum. Um, just give us a sense of um, if, if, if you are successful, you, you are in that position. Has it changed your life? And if so, how? <laughs> right. Uh, yes, it was just a six-figure sum, and that's putting <laughs> that's putting ever that's putting everything together, i.e., the executive producer fee and things like that. Bearing in mind that straight away you have twenty percent taken off for commission for the agent, and bearing in mind that you then have to pay tax on that, and so it ends up being about. Uh, half of what that of what that top end top end figure is, and the whole process took such a long time that it doesn't feel like it. And the really key thing is is you don't get any serious mo money until the first day of principal photography, and so you know it, that's the that's the kaching moment. And it in my experience. It was game changing, but it wasn't life changing. Okay. Um, mm. uh, uh, and that's the the game changing was partly about partly about the partly about the money, but it was also because a lot more people in the industry want to talk to me now about ideas, and I have come to that point that Luke was talking about. I thought very sensibly where although I am involved in writing one of the two projects at the moment, what I like is the idea of coming up with ideas because I, I have a relatively good idea of, of, of how the world works. 
and just feeding those ideas to people who have the skill to turn them into really effective um, television drama. Because the one thing I'd say about McMafia, for me, the most important thing, uh, global organized crime, corruption, the relationship between criminals and politicians and so on, is, a, is central to the problems we've faced over the past, past 30 years, inequality and so on and so forth. And the fact is, having it as a major TV show in the United Kingdom, the United States and elsewhere around the world, it gives that idea and the, you know, the political issues associated with it so much more power than, you know, I mean, people like the book, but, you know, it's I not Harry Potter. Reaches a much, yeah, great. I think that's a really important point. Sorry, Luke. No, sorry, good mark, not to, sorry. I, don't, I was going to say, like, I mean, you know, the thing about drama, character-driven drama that deals in real real stories, whether it's the post office scandal to the HBOS, the, pe the human beings at the center of the HBOS scandal, to quiz, that's a great example, or Brexit. Taking, you know, digging down into these characters and it allows you, the drama allows you to interrogate these subjects on a much bigger scale than most often a factual documentary can, to be brutally honest. I mean, Misha's the expert. I mean, Misha, didn't, didn't McMafia, um, wasn't there a parliamentary debate directly as a result of that project? Well, there's, yeah, there's the McMafia law, which was basically, it was, it was passed. So that was, you know, I mean, that's fantastic when the title of your book becomes, becomes a thing, you know, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't get much better. But just, can we just go back, just, just go back to Monique, sorry, I, I won't, I'll stop hogging, sorry. I think, I think um, journalists, I just, you know, they've got to understand that they are in a very powerful position right now, as Misha said, as Martin's indicated, and it's, there's, there's all sorts of different ways of, creating, you know, revenue streams based on your work. You know, um, obviously having, working with an agency, they can help you navigate that uh, and advise you, you know, and you can instruct us how you'd want to proceed. But as I said, you know, some of our clients are earning close to six figures a year um, just from development work and it allows them to take, you know, sabbaticals from their desk job work, you know, from their, from their reporting on a day-to-day -day level to focus on, that, and that's been life changing for a lot of people, and that hasn't. That's only really happened in the last five or six years, you know. And I, it's only going to get better. And we've had situations where you know journalists have created a podcast. We've had a twenty-way bidding war, and we, we're selling them for seven figures. You know, that's the level of interest that we're talking about right now. And, and what we haven't mentioned in any of this um, is the extraordinary amount of money that is flooding into the development and acquisition of content from yeah. Apple and from Netflix. And, you know, this is, you know, it's, I remember Alan Shearer once saying that when the premiership started to get big, big money, it was a great time to be a professional footballer. But it, it is a great time to be a, a journalist, isn't it, who is covering fascinating, gripping, compelling stories. It is one of the one of the reviews of Official Secrets talked about the Fifth Estate, said that there is now on top of the Fourth Estate there is now this Fifth Estate of of TV and film making, which allows stories um, to to really take off in, in a way that they can't in print uh, and they can't uh, as documentaries. And um, I mean that's not to belittle the importance of, of print and online media and, and documentary filmmaking. But I, there is nothing quite like what happens when um, a film takes off or a, or a TV series takes off. And if that can lead, as in the, the case that Misha's talking about, that, to there being a McMafia law, um, then there are, there are wider, you know, this has a wider significance for our um, civil society. And I think that's that's what we need to be moving f towards. It's that, uh, you know, in this new world, there is this new form of journalism, which is, which is this, um, th this kind of filmmaking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, these, some of the, the great series, you know, The Wire and, you know, these, these are the great novels really of our time in the way that Dickens chronicled, you know, um, social issues. They are, you have the space and the time in a, you know, in a 13 part series to really, really go into the granular, explore the granular detail of, uh, you know, of a particular area of society. And it's, 
you know, when it's done well, it's kind of thrilling, isn't it? You could even say like, so like Chernobyl, that's actually, you know, quite a fact. You've talked to Craig Mazin. That's a factually accurate piece of journalism. Mm. It's, it, it's an incredible series if you watch that. You know, um, I think Quiz is a great example. I, I referenced that earlier. We had a very, there's a very clear perception that the media put out about the, the couple at the center of, the, of that scandal. And it's by James Graham, who's a brilliant writer, you know, telling these different POVs and allowed you into that world. And I think that was a great way of actually looking at that, actually, that particular news story, you know? Sure. Now, we've got a question here uh, from Sarah Hamilton. Sarah, I'm going to press allow you to talk. If you could unmute yourself and, uh, yeah. Hello, are you receiving? Uh, Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, I've just got too many questions, hopefully it won't take up too much time. But um, first of all, to Luke, um, I'm familiar with pitching a novel to an agent, but how does it work with pitching a news story with drama potential? Do you still require sort of a synopsis and so on? And a general question, um, if I'm interested in uh, dramatising a court case, which potentially has a huge cast of characters, um, how far is it necessary to spread the net of, of courtesy, I suppose, to tell certain people that we're looking at dramatizing this this intense event um sorry my sorry can you just repeat the first question again like you broke up a little bit the oh, first sorry. Question, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just paraphrase it sarah very quickly so the difference between pitching a piece of journalism do you, do you need a treatment do you need to do it in exactly the same way as you would pit, pitch a fic fictional project no, no, not really. I think I think it depends on whether you have to take a sort of strategic point of view. Say, is there enough in the article to get people interested? You know, have you identified the characters? You know, Misha said, producers hone in on characters, not necessarily the world or the actual story. It's more about that character. So, you know, if the article is good enough, then we just take it into the market as is. To be honest with you, um, sometimes you, you know, as I said before, if you're working under contract and you're not able to freely sell the rights to that article then you might have to create um, a separate piece of IP, which effectively is a treatment, which is retelling the story, but you own it and then you can sell it. And the second question about the court case, how, how wide does the, the net of courtesy have to be spread in, in terms of covering that, it? That's a very tricky question. Probably Melissa should like, step in and help answer that one as well. Yes, um, so I get asked this a lot because obviously, you know, it's quite daunting to think that you have to approach, you know, 30 different people to get their permission um, for you to use them in your in your content. I think it goes back to what I was saying about doing a risk assessment against each person. So there's, you know, there's certain questions that I would ask my clients like dead or alive. Um, how central is this subject to the story? How offensive? Um, is the portrayal going to be? Could it damage their reputation? Um, are they a public figure? There's loads of different questions because it's basically a risk assessment that you have to do. And if and if somebody is, um, you know, zero or low risk, you may just think, well, they're not going to have a claim for defamation. They're not going to have a claim for invasion of privacy. What else could they come, at, you know, come at me for? And if and if there isn't really a risk, then then fine. Um, however, obviously, if if you're looking at high risk people then then you know the exact opposite would apply you, you better off getting permission from them and it's worth saying that you know quite a lot of the time people are just happy to sign releases and there's no negotiation um they really don't mind so you know it might it might seem daunting to begin with but if you just kind of go through it methodically mm -hmm. with the help of you know your lawyer or or whoever your advisor is then then usually you can make a you know a risk assessment at the end of it and work out who needs to be approached and who doesn't um and then there's the whole there's the whole um topic of publicly available information and are you using court transcripts because if you're lifting quotes from court transcripts and you're allowed to do it because you've got permission then you know that's a whole different avenue i think the particular scenario you've given is the tricky one because it's a court setting as opposed to just a general real life setting um but it's, it's not impossible to do I think I also you got to bear in mind we're working on a project at the moment that's um, actually a movie and it's shooting next year and the, the trial only uh, concluded recently and we you know the my client couldn't uh, he written the book about this individual and um, couldn't engage with him because the ongoing trial we didn't want to create any prejudice against the uh, the person at the center of the story and um, the issue was that what if 
what if he can't profit from that because of Son of Sam rules? And I'm sure, Melissa, you, you'd be the expert on explaining that in terms of not being able to profit from the actual crime. So the other side of that, the other side would be, you know, working out that do I absolutely need a couple of people to add value to my story before I look to talk to producers with it? Okay, I'm really sorry. We, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, and we've now got a couple of hands up. So I'm, I'm sorry, I've been told that we really do have to stop now. So um, I don't know what quite, quite what happens at the end of uh, a Zoom session like this, whether <laughs> we can, everyone can be unmuted and we can all applaud uproariously in our own homes. Um, <clears throat> but if that, uh, if that isn't possible, um, can I just thank our very distinguished panel? Can I thank Martin, Melissa, Luke uh, and Misha for an incredibly interesting insightful uh, look at a very exciting new world for, for journalists and um, maybe not so new for, for some of you but certainly uh, I think more and more journalists now are beginning to think about uh, you know whether there is potential for drama podcast document whatever in the stories that they're covering and they're, if they've listened to this they'll be um, I think really well served and, and much better able to come to a view of how they how they do it how they make that successful um, so thank you so much. Thanks to the Frontline Club. Can I also uh, remind everyone who's tuned in, uh, can you uh, please, the Frontline Club says, don't forget about other upcoming events. And if you go to the, the website, the events section, you'll see that there are regular fantastic events coming up uh, at the Frontline Club. Uh, so please do go and have a look at those. And um, thank, thanks to everybody for this evening. Really interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.